by God's grace and for his glory. This is Woodmont Baptist Church. Yes, we can apply for Nate Burbank, who is unbelievable every time. Good morning. Happy New Year. Hey, we're, we don't normally do this, but we're kind of more family feel here this morning. Why don't you just look around somebody nearby and say, hey, welcome. Glad you're here. Happy New Year. Greet one another for just a second. I know we're Baptists and we hate doing that. If you have to yell for social distancing, that's fine. We're tearing down the walls this morning. We... Uh, we are so glad you guys are here this morning joining us on January 2nd, a, a new day, a new year, and everything that that means. If you're a guest here with us this morning, we are doubly glad that you're here, and we would love the chance to get to know you a little bit better, let you get to know us a little bit as well. So the best way to do that is by filling out the Connect card, which you can find either online at woodmontbaptist.com. It's on, uh, there's a little QR code on the back of your bulletin. You can scan and pull it up as well, or there should be a connect card in the back of your pew or right outside at the welcome kiosk. Fill that out, get that back to us. One of us will be in touch with you. It's not a scam. We're not trying to get your information or anything like that. We just want your social security, bank account numbers, all that stuff. And we'll go from there. No, we really would love a chance to get to connect with you, so please do that. Um, as always, we are so grateful for your giving and continued giving. We would love to start this new year off offering God back what he's already given to us, right? We give out of abundance. So you can continue to do that either in person uh, at the kiosk outside via text or online again at woodmontbaptist.com. Last announcement for you this morning, we are very, very close to starting Wednesday nights back again. So January 12th, not this coming Wednesday, but the week after, we'll be starting back with midweek, kid services, uh, youth, all of the above will be coming back and we would love to see you there. If you're new and would like more information about that, you can always check our website or please come find either Aaron or myself or Lil Cook in the back, our senior adults minister. We would love to tell you more about Wednesday nights and get you plugged in. I think that's everything I have. Aaron, it's all you guys. Well, good morning. Let's start this new year the right way with worship. So let's stand together and sing hymn 349, To God Be the Glory. Let's worship.
Amen. You may be seated this morning. Hi. Will you pray with me, please? Father God, we come to you today starting a brand new year and ask that you be with us all, Lord, in 2022. We know not what tomorrow brings, so we put our trust in you. As Evan is preaching today from Galatians, it reminds me of one of my favorite verses from this book. And Lord, I ask you to help us to be brand new and give us a new mindset of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control the fruits of the Spirit we so desperately need. Father, please be with those members who can't worship with us in person and surround them with your love. Give them strength and a blanket of protection, Lord, for whatever they are facing. Please heal those who are sick, including all who are suffering from the COVID virus. We thank you, God, for new beginnings and second chances for all your creations, for your mercy and grace, and for a fresh start. And it is in your name I pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Let's continue in worship this morning as we stand together and sing be thou my vision. Let's stand and worship.
Let's worship together as Denise leads. Sorry, Denise. <laughs> we're a little crowded back here. <laughs> Denise and I were joking before. I am so glad. I think every time I preach, she's also been singing up here, and she just makes me feel so much comfortable because she's so good at what she does. I feel like I can be better and make up for what I'm not good at. So if you see Denise in the hallway, give her, give her a fist bump. Tell her you're grateful for her. Glad she's here at this church serving this way. Um, so we're gonna continue our series in Isaiah. I'm just kidding. We're, we're not in Isaiah this morning, I promise. We are past that. You know, this week, uh, there was a video that went viral recently of a kid. So a, a mom had, if you can imagine this, a mom had apparently told her child to stop running in the house. And I know it's hard to believe, but the, the little fella decided that was more of like a suggestion than an actual rule that was being told to him. So he didn't stop running in the house, and the mom decided the best way to take care of this was she's gonna sit in her chair, she's gonna stick her feet out, she pulls her phone out, starts videoing, and just waits for the kid to come running through. Because toddlers, toddlers don't understand the concept of tripping for some reason. You can tell them eight times that that toy's gonna make them fall, but when they finally do, they look at you like, what happened? I don't understand this. So 
So the mom's sitting there, she sticks her feet out. Kid comes barreling through the house, thinking he's invincible. Naturally, he trips over her feet. And what do you think the mom said to him? This is, this is the response portion of our time. Jamie, what do you think the mom said to him? I told you to stop running in my house. I done told you to stop running in my house. And this video of this kid looking at her with just sheer shock. And he's just like, how could this happen to me? And she just is ruthless with it. I told you to stop running in my house. Now, as parents, none of you in this room are thinking, that's a little bit harsh, don't you think? Like, at least, you know, give the kid an explanation. No, because we know that sometimes as parents, a harsh dose of reality is the only thing that's going to get through to a kid. Sometimes that's what it takes. Now, you don't do it out of, you know, vindictive anger. That's weird. Don't do that. But you do it out of love, out of loving anger for the kid because they don't understand the danger of the situation they're in. They're not grasping what's at stake here. So the book of Galatians, where we're going to dive in today, is Paul's I told you to stop running in the house letter. This is Paul's I told you to stop running in the house. You can feel the frustration and the worry in this letter. This isn't a lifeless, cold, you know, drill sergeant just ripping into his people for no reason. This is a compassionate and loving father who cares about his kids and is worried that they don't see the danger in the things they're dabbling in. So he writes this letter then with the kind of intensity and bluntness that only a loved one can really speak with you as. And he drives home a clear line around what the gospel is and what the gospel is not. So I'm going to give you a spoiler for the next three months of Galatians right now. This is what Paul says the gospel is and what it is not. If you're in Christ by faith, which is the only way you can get in, the game has changed for us. Actually, a better way to say it, the game has not changed. We're playing a different sport entirely at this point. We used to spend our days trying to make ourselves feel like we're good, trying to get by, trying to feel like we're in a good place with, you know, God, the universe, life, other people, ourselves. Say it how you want. We, we all try these different things. But really all we got in the end was frustration and anxiety and failures over and over again with tiny moments of happiness along the way. But God has opened up a newer, a better, a truer, a realer reality. Something fundamental has been changed in you by Jesus, something incredible. You have forgiveness and you're made righteous in Christ. I can't think of a more important thing to focus on at the start of a new year. I especially can't think of a more important thing at the start of this new year. Have we ever been more aware in our lifetime at how unhelpful and failing our world is and we are? It simply can't give us what we need. Lil, our, uh, our senior adults minister, she sent me a text earlier this week with this quote. Corporate worship is designed to instill vertical hope where horizontal hope has been dashed. Corporate worship is designed to instill vertical hope where horizontal hope has been dashed. I love that. It's what Galatians is all about. It's what the gospel is all about. The horizontal hope, the, the old paths, they're always gonna let us down. But if we're ready to get serious, if we're ready to take the leap, if honestly, if we're ready to take the first step or even think about taking the first step, God is chomping at the bit to give us a vertical hope that does not let us down. What if God is saying to us right here on January 2nd, 2022, it's time to let real hope have its way. Let's make our resolutions, okay? Resolutions are great. I wanna help you get to your resolution. I wanna hear about them, they're wonderful. Let's try to do better this year, but let's not do it with grit and determination. Let's not do it holding our breath and plunging through, just trying to force our ways into it. We know where that goes. That's how we end up completely at a loss of what we're supposed to do with life. 
our relationships get strained because honestly, we're trying to do our resolution and why aren't the people around me helping me more to accomplish them? Don't they care about my well-being? We get frustrated with people for that and inevitably, hilariously, so annoyingly, life always comes along and messes up all our plans. Case in point, how many of us had big plans for Christmas that got completely turned around at some point during the holidays? Probably all of us, right? Our plans life is laughing at, and it comes along and messes it up. So that's the cul-de-sac of horizontal hope. It spins you around and it takes you back in the same place over and over again, going nowhere. Let's not go into 2022 that way. Instead, let's go into 2022 taking the message of Galatians to heart. That the fundamental foundation of our very goodness in our life has been swallowed up in the person and work of Jesus Christ when we put our faith in him. Not as a, a past event that we just like to remember, not as a theological exercise, but as the reality that God has taken us from the non-reality of this world into the full reality of his. So Galatians chapter one, verses one through nine. Here's what it says. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever, amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. So Paul comes out the gate here, making sure that we know two things. One, he's an apostle. That means, you know, Paul's not a guy standing on the corner with a sign. Paul's not just some random guy off the street saying he heard a message from God. Becoming an apostle was a closed market at this point. The only people who were allowed to be apostles were the 11 disciples who had spent the most time with Jesus while he was alive, minus Judas, because, you know. And then there was one guy who got added, who the other, who had spent much time with Jesus, less than the apostles, but they decided this was the guy to fill the spot that Judas had left. And then there was Paul, who had experienced such a remarkable encounter with the resurrected Jesus that the other apostles look at him and go, that's for real. That guy has encountered Jesus. He's an apostle with us. He's been picked out by God, which is the second thing that Paul wanted us to know. He didn't get apostleship from people. He's not an apostle by popular vote. He wasn't an apostle because the other 12 said so. He was made an apostle because Jesus picked him. And that's not like in a, you know, will and testament, last will and testament, or like a please do this in memory, memory of me, put in place by some lawyer mumbo jumbo on the other side. Jesus, the living Jesus, who Paul says was made alive by God the Father, that's the one who put Paul in as an apostle. You know this, I probably don't need to say this, but Jesus didn't abandon us when he went to be with the Father. On the night Jesus was leaving, before he was arrested, he said, I'm going away to the Father, but I'm sending you a helper, the Spirit. And the whole rest of the New Testament is testifying that the Spirit is executing Jesus' will from heaven right now, as Jesus is right up there, right now, pleading on your behalf before the Father. Jesus is still in control of everything that's happening down here. So Paul is saying that that Jesus, the one who is living, the one who is in control, the one who is still with us by the Spirit, that's the one who picked him as an apostle. So why make this such a sticking point? Why does Paul care so much? Well, because there were some people visiting the Galatians 
who were saying, you know, Paul's got some nice ideas. He's got some stuff right. There's some good in what he's saying, but he's a little behind the eight ball. There, there's a bit more to this thing than he's telling you. And those people claim to be sent by the other apostles, the ones in Jerusalem, the real apostles, they would say. The problem was they weren't sent by those apostles. So if you can imagine, it's like sixth grade, Woodland Middle School, little Evan sitting in science class, okay? Uh, we were making a battery light bulb, like circuit board that day kind of thing. I'm not an engineer. I don't understand that stuff, but we were doing it. And I am not, I was not the well put, to, well put together success you see today. I can't even speak. I'm clearly not. So I was not who I am today, and I forgot my battery at home. When I realized it, my stomach dropped through the floor. I was terrified, but a friend of mine in class said, hey, don't worry about it, man. Teacher told me she's got a battery drawer over there. You just go, you borrow a battery, you put it back when you're done, everything will be totally fine. So that's hope for me. The alternative was getting a demerit, so I was like, yes, I will go get a battery from the battery drawer. Problem solved. Until second period, when my science teacher came into class and took me out because someone had tipped her off that I had stolen a battery from her. To which I said, I didn't steal it, I borrowed it. And I hear how that sounds now to her as a sixth grader saying that to an adult. So it's no surprise now that I got Saturday school for that comment back to her and for stealing a battery. It was a horrible situation for me. I still clearly am working through it. <laughs> that kid in class had told me that the teacher gave him this information. So I trusted his information because of the authority behind it. The problem was he made the entire thing up. I don't know why, maybe he was just messing with me, but he got me in trouble and I was landed with the consequences because I trusted his authority. So the Galatians need to know for sure whose message they can trust. Who has authority in this matter? Because we're not talking about batteries here, we're talking about the gospel itself. That's why Paul is so adamant they understand his authority is not coming from any person. It's not coming from the other apostles. It's definitely not coming from these fake teachers who weren't even sent by the apostles, but directly from God. And just to add a little extra weight as evidence, he says, oh, by the way, all the people with me say hi. Just translation is, I got a whole crew with me who's gonna verify everything I'm saying. They're saying this is for real. So Paul's authority comes from God, which means Paul's message can be trusted because it doesn't come from people, it comes from God. It's not influenced by people pleasing or trying to make sense to us. It's God's message to his people. And Paul says, this is the message. This is in verse four. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. So the message of Paul is you've been given grace and peace. Why? Because God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ made a sacrifice beyond our calculations. They traded Jesus' righteous life for our sinful life. So righteousness is one of those churchy words that we all vaguely understand, but none of us would want to answer what it means. Oftentimes with the youth, I will ask a question like, hey, does everybody know what righteousness means? And they'll all nod their heads, and then I'll say, great, who wants to explain it? Crickets. Nobody wants to explain it, because it's, it's weird. We don't really know how to explain it. What does it really mean? So the way the Bible explains righteousness is this. To be righteous is to be good like God is good. It means you can be depended on to do the right thing in the right way every time with the right motives. There's no shadow side or ulterior motives going on. There's no covering up or nothing to apologize for. There's no lies or manipulation. There's no lingering questions or confusion or uncertainty about us. There's no error or failure in keeping in line with who God is. Now, do you know anyone like that? Probably not, right? But we might not know other people like that, but we often think of ourselves like that, or at least that we're getting closer to being like that. The problem with our world isn't just that we're not righteous. 
God can work with people who aren't righteous. In fact, he has a special talent for people who don't have it together. The problem with our world is that we imagine we are righteous, even while we're not. So um, imagine with me, you're stuck in traffic right out here at the light on Hillsboro because it's traffic all the time on Hillsboro. And they've got a lane shut down for some reason that none of us can figure out. And so it's doubly bad traffic. You've been sitting out of life forever. And some guy swings out in the, in the turn lane and blocks the intersection. And now you're stuck at the red light for like another hour because it's gonna take forever for you to keep moving on Hillsboro. Now, when that happens, is your first thought, well, I probably would have done the same thing if that were me. Or, you know, well, they probably have somewhere really important to get to, so like, I understand. Or is your first thought more along my lines, which is, what an idiot. Why would you do that? Why are you a bad driver? And honestly, most of the time, I look for a license plate and I'm always like, oh, pfft, Alabama, of course it is. It had to be, that's why. And I judged them completely, right? It is. I don't know why other people can't just get on the same page as me all the time, all right? It is a burden being right all of the time in my life. Married people, how many of your arguments started because one of you just had to correct the other one on something? You just could not keep it a secret. Men, we literally have a phrase for this now about our compulsive need to correct people. It's called mansplaining. That's man explaining put together because we do it all the time, okay? We talk about virtue signaling and cancel culture today. We, we hold up our defense of inclusion or social justice or fighting for the unborn or for freedom or public health or our commitment to the Democratic Party, or our commitment to the Republican Party or our opposition to one of those parties. And we wear these things as badges of honor. Or if you're more like me and you're, you're kind of the lowest of the low, you hold up your religion and you think this is what puts me on another moral plane than anybody else. And I can look around other people and go, man, I may not be like great God, but like, at least I'm not like them. Thank God I'm not like that person. We're convinced of our righteousness, but it's just a house of cards. We are desperately trying to prove that it's something more sure and stable than that, but all the while, we are weighed down by this just canyon between who we like to think we are and what reality is. You know, a few of the, uh, a few of the college students and I, we were talking about how badly we want to be just one person all the time. Wouldn't it be incredible to not have to think about, all right, I need to be this person with that group because that's who I act around them as, and then I need to be this person with that group because that's how I act around them as, and to not have to juggle that stuff. Wouldn't it be amazing if we didn't have any lingering if-onlys or late-night anxiety keeping you up about how can I fix the thing I did to this person what if every New Year's we could say to all the people asking about our resolutions, I'm good, and like really mean it? What if we didn't have a nagging sense that we need to be better all the time? Wouldn't that be incredible? So there exists this tension for us, all of us, between longing to be righteous, sometimes thinking we are, sometimes thinking we figure things out, and then immediately realizing we've not got this thing figured out. We're nowhere near as righteous as we thought. We're like kids trying to shove a square peg in a round hole, and we cannot figure out why it won't work. This is exactly where the Galatians found themselves. They'd heard the gospel from Paul, and they had jumped just all in, and not superficially. As we read throughout the letter, we're going to read that Paul is utterly convinced that they are real believers, and he's sure they're going to make the right choice in the end. They had really put their faith in Jesus, but they are struggling. They're thinking, Paul, if we're not in this present age anymore, as you say, if we've been delivered, then why do I struggle with sin and temptation so much still? If we're really forgiven and made right with God, why doesn't it always feel that way? 
If we're being transformed by the Spirit and Jesus is working among us as a church, as a group, then why does our church so often not look like that's the case? If God is with us, then why are we still being pressured and questioned by our world? Why do we feel out of place? This can't be how things are supposed to go. I mean, could the book of Galatians be more relatable? Haven't we all wondered the same thing in one way or another? In our, in our lives, yes, but even more so just over the past year. I would be willing to wager that every person in this room has had a conversation with one other fellow believer at some point over the last year and thought, how can they think that and still be a Christian? Even worse, over the last year, we probably had moments where we looked at ourselves and thought, how can I imagine myself a Christian? if I've done this, or if I'm still struggling with this. The Galatians are wondering the same kinds of questions, and then along come these fake teachers, or as Paul says in chapter two, these false brothers who slipped in. Probably Jewish Christians, from what we can tell, claiming to be sent by the apostles, the original apostles from Jerusalem, those who Paul later calls pillars, important people, and they say, you're right. It's not supposed to be this way. Paul got you halfway in the door, but right now you're half-baked Christians. That's why things feel out of whack in your life. That's why you don't feel forgiven. That's why you're still facing hard times. Your religion is too loose. It's too flabby. You're not in all the way yet. So what these teachers argue was, yes, believe in the gospel of Jesus, but the next level of that is taking on the outward observances of the Jewish law. Eat this food, don't eat this food, celebrate these certain days, read these certain books, listen to this certain music, associate with these certain people. If you jump, they argued, into Judaism wholesale as a compliment to your faith in Jesus, then you'll be a complete Christian. You got one foot in, let's go all the way is what they're saying. And the Galatians loved it. Paul says he was astonished at how quickly they deserted. So there was no prolonged theological debate. They didn't have a committee meeting about this. They didn't sit down and work over it in Bible study. They jumped all in when they heard what was said. And we have to ask why. Why would someone do that? Alan Cole, he has a a really great commentary on Galatians. You should check it out. It's on Amazon. But he says this. Perhaps another reason for the rapid fall was the subtle attraction of trying to do something to earn their own salvation. Impossible task, though it may be. Human pride finds it very hard to accept free grace. If at this moment they were faced with eager Jewish Christian missionaries who offered them a detailed system of moral and ritual rules designed especially to control these manifestations of the flesh, this rigid outward discipline must have seemed very attractive to earnest souls who would come to the conclusion that the path of freedom did not work for them as indeed the Judaizers had probably always maintained, and that their basic natures had not changed. So we have the Galatian Christians, sincere as can be, struggling to feel right with God, struggling to feel like they were genuinely saved, struggling to understand this righteousness by faith system Paul is talking about. If we can be honest, guys, that's hard. That is a hard thing to wrap our heads around. Anybody who says that faith is a cop-out or makes things easy has clearly never put it into practice before. It is difficult to act on faith when it comes to our practical everyday living. I would say it's even harder to act on faith when it comes to believing that we are really made righteous with God. Something we can't even see. Something we can't control. And we have to just trust that God's word is right on that even when we don't feel it, when so much of my life pushes back against that belief. So struggling Christians are being offered something concrete and manageable in adopting the outward religion of Judaism. And I think we can all understand why that would be so attractive. But Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Paul's saying they've turned from the gospel to a no gospel, a not gospel, something that is not even real. If I'm the Galatians, I'm going, it's just some helpful tools, Paul. What is the big deal about this thing? 
Paul doesn't have an issue with the actions of Judaism. Like, he's going to talk about circumcision a lot. So let's just get comfortable talking about that for a bit. Paul is going to talk about circumcision a lot. Toward the end of the book, he's going to say, circumcision doesn't matter. Uncircumcision doesn't matter. They don't matter. They are weightless. There is no significance one way or the other to it. Do what you'd like. It's not about the actions. Here's what's going on. In verse 4, Paul says, Jesus gave himself for our sins to, here's the purpose, to deliver us from this present evil age. Hmm. But what's so evil about our age? What's so wrong with it? Well, according to Paul, throughout the entire book of Galatians, he's worried most about our dogged self-righteousness. You know, we imagine the danger for Christians is that someone can receive the grace of Christ, and then take advantage of it by continuing to live in sin. That's not the greatest threat to our faith. We can spot somebody living in sin a mile away, and we can deal with that. The greatest threat to our faith, what Paul is most worried about, is our tendency towards self-righteous, do-it-yourself religiosity, religiousness, that depends on me and not on Christ by faith. That's how we used to do things. That's how this age does things. We earn things on merit in this age, we like to think. But the gospel tosses that way in the trash. Jesus came to give himself our sins, you bet, but that was just the vehicle. That was the you know, memory wipe of the computer so that it could be rebooted with a new system altogether. That's delivering us from that way of living. Guys, if you're in Christ, your body might be here on this earth for another you know, 20, 40, 60 years or so, but you're already living under a totally new reality. If you're in Christ, your body might be here, but you are living in a totally new reality already. Fix-it-yourself religion has no place in our thinking anymore. You've got to realize the gospel says that what you do, the good and the bad, is the least consequential thing about you. That is not to say it's not important. That does not mean it doesn't matter, but it is the least consequential thing about you. The entry level point for the gospel is being a rock bottom sinner. So if that's not you, we'd love to have you here, but you're not going to find much that you want here in that case. If you're not a rock bottom sinner, you're not going to find a whole lot that seems appealing to you here. If you're hoping for something to make you seem more impressive and moral to people, Jesus is not what you're looking for. And being a part of a church sounds like a good club to belong to, good for your social standing, good for you to use your talents and exercise your gifts. I'm sorry, but you're not going to like what we offer here. That's just not what this is about. The cross isn't going to have any point for you. You wouldn't want it. We're here because we are rock bottom sinners, unimpressive, moral and religious dropouts who couldn't cut it on our own and know we need somebody else to do this thing for us because we can't be good enough. So we're looking to Christ as our external righteousness, not one that I have in me, but one that is given to me. So if that's you, if you're a rock bottom sinner like me, you're in luck. Jesus is just a thing for you. He says he'll take the standing with God he rightly earned and he'll give it to anyone who puts their faith in him. And when that happens, it's like you stop existing as you and you start existing in Christ. And I got news for you, really good news actually. Jesus doesn't have an up and down relationship with God. So in the sense that matters most, outside of what you think God feels about you or anyone else, in the sense outside of the good things and the terrible things you or anyone else does, or your ability to believe really, really strongly and good, you are good with God because Jesus is good with God and you are found in Christ. Friends, I'm here to tell you, operating in that reality of freedom and grace, of external righteousness given to us, changes everything. That is the nuclear core that powers Christianity. That is the heart of everything that drives us. It's the reason we can be different is because Christ has given us his righteousness and he lives inside of us and we live as him now in the eyes of God. 
Christians live different because they live and move and breathe within the grace given, faith found righteousness of Christ. So what these false teachers ran the risk of doing was robbing the cross of all its power. They were trying to convince the Galatians that taking up these Jewish laws, starting with circumcision, was a necessary step if they wanted to be really saved. And the Galatians were buying it. The Galatians had finally put away all that stuff. They had stepped into the freedom of Christ, but were now trying to jump back into the old way of doing things. They were trying to take a step away from the freedom of Christ and back into do-it-yourself religion. And Paul's whole argument in the book of Galatians, it's really, really simple, guys. There's, there's a lot of theology in here, but it boils down to this. He's looking at them trying to step back into that way, and he's going, why would you want to? Why would we want to? What, what, is, what is back there that you want to go back to? Did it work? The question he's asking us as well is, why would we want to? Why would we want to go back to fix-it-yourself, do-it-yourself religion and self-righteousness that never worked for us in the first place? Let's level with each other here today. We have all, even today, even this morning, had moments of leaning more on our rightness than Christ. It's who we are. It's our tendency We've had moments, even today, of looking at others and not seeing them as existing in Christ, but as the screw-ups we so often are. We've acted like frustrated, do-it-ourselves saviors that can't understand why God isn't doing the things I want him to do in the time I want him to do it, in the way I want him to do it, because I have been good, God, and I've done the right things. Why isn't everything working out? We felt that way even today. We might even be crushed right now feeling that way inside of us that, man, am I really resting in the righteousness of Christ or what have I been doing? Where has my heart been at? And that's a scary place to be, if you ask me, but it's the important place to be. That's great. If that's where you're at and if you're ready to admit that this morning, then you're right where you need to be. The important thing is what comes next. Guys, let's not start another year running back to that cul-de-sac of horizontal hope. No false saviors, no pointless roads. We're done that. We're done with it. Instead, let's start putting our full weight on the vertical hope that Jesus is extending to us right now. I'll close with this. Uh, C.S. Lewis his, his book, The Great Divorce, is just one of my favorite works of all time. It's, it's the thing that helps me reframe my mind better than almost anything else outside of the Bible and the Spirit of Christ. There's a conversation in it between two spirits, uh, one from heaven and one from hell. And I want to read this to you. This is incredible to me. There is no mean time, replied the other. All that is over. We are not playing now. I have been talking about the past, your past and mine, only in order that you may turn from it forever. One wrench and the tooth will be out. You can begin as if nothing had ever gone wrong, white as snow. It's all true, you know. He is in me for you with that power. And I have come a long way to journey to meet with you. You have seen hell. You are inside of heaven. Will you even now repent and believe? I'm not so sure that I've got the exact point you're trying to make, said the ghost. I'm not trying to make any point, said the spirit. I am telling you to repent and believe. But my dear boy, I believe already. We may not be perfectly agreed, but you have completely misjudged me if you do not realize that my religion is a very real and a very precious thing to me. Very well, said the other, as if changing his plan. Will you believe in me? In what sense? Will you come with me to the mountains? It will hurt at first until your feet are hardened. Reality is harsh to the feet of shadows. But will you come? Well, that is a plan. I'm perfectly ready to consider it. Of course, I should require some assurances. I should want to guarantee that you are taking me to a place where I shall find a wider sphere of usefulness and scope for the talents that God has given me and an atmosphere of free inquiry. In short, all that one means by civilization and the spiritual life. No, said the other. I cannot promise you none of these things. No sphere of usefulness. You are not needed there at all. No scope for your talents. 
only forgiveness for having perverted them. No atmosphere of inquiry, for I will bring you to the land, not of questions, but of answers, and you shall see the face of God. There is no meantime, guys. This moment is the moment that has all moments in it, depending on what choice we make. Where will we lean? Jesus offers us a righteousness not of our own that we can't earn, and that's far better than anything we'd get. Will we take it? That's the question offered to us. And that's what this moment we're going into is all about. We call it communion because it reminds us that we stopped existing when we put our faith in Jesus and we started living in him. And we call it communion because it makes us look around at everyone else that's true for, the people in the room with us who have also found themselves in Christ. So in just a minute, if you are a baptized believer in Christ, we're going to uh, take our cups and we're going to partake of the communion together. If you are not a believer in Christ, there is no meantime. There is nothing to go back to. No questions to ask anymore. Is our life so good that what Jesus has to offer sounds bad to us? I know what the answer has been for me and for many in this room. So if you wanna talk about that, um, we would love to do so. I'll be here uh, during this next moment, I'll be here after the service. Aaron Duncan and Will Cook and many others will be around if you wanna talk more about what it means to be a follower of Christ. If you wanna find out what this righteousness not your own is all about, we would love to talk about that. So in just a moment, we're going to partake of communion. But before we do, uh, Nate is wonderfully sneaking his way up here and he's going to play some quiet music. And we're going to take a moment to reflect and prepare our hearts for the immensity of what this means. What it means to be in communion with Christ and what difference that makes for us. So take these next few moments just between you and Jesus.
Um, the night that uh, Jesus was betrayed and went to the cross, he had wine and bread with his friends. And he told them this would be the last time he did that until he did it at the celebration to end all celebrations, when he comes back. So this little cup is not just a reminder of what has happened, but it's a promise of what will happen. A promise that we can see and taste and touch, something concrete for us to remind us that what Christ said he did, he really did do. What he said he will do, he really will do. We get to partake of that. So we take the bread, which is the body of Christ broken for us, and we eat it in remembrance of him. And we take the juice, which is the blood of Christ shed for our sins, and we take of it. Jesus, we, uh, we confess that so much of the time we miss it. And we struggle to believe and we have so many questions. But the answers are in you. So I pray for us here today that we would find ourselves not in the things we do or the strength of our hearts to believe or in our mind's ability to understand, but we would find ourselves in you more than anything else. That that would be the powerhouse that changes who we are. Lord, we pray for revival in Nashville. We pray for change. We don't want to play church or religion anymore. We want you to do something we would never have seen coming, and we know you can. We thank you for who you are, for us, to us. And we just ask that you would see fit to use us in any way you would. We pray all this in your name. Amen. As Evan says, we're going to have a time of response um, where we sing how deep the Father's love for us. So I invite you to stand. Evan will be down front. If you would like to come pray, if you want to talk to anybody, uh, we are here uh, to be here with you. Let's worship.
It has been so good being with you guys today on this new year. Happy New Year again. Um, we hope to see you guys coming back around for Wednesday nights on the 12th. If there is anything you need to talk about, any questions you have, whether it's about our church or about faith, we will still be here after the service. We'd love to talk some more. Um, let's get you out of here. Would you extend your hands uh, and quote, bow your heads, as Nathan says? Sorry, I was from a different church. We extended our hands. You just bow your heads for the benediction. <laughs> May God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. This has been the live broadcast of Woodmont Baptist Church. If you would like to know more about the people and programs at Woodmont, or if you would like to stream both live and pre-recorded services, go to woodmontbaptist.com or call us at 615-297-5303. This program is funded by the members and supporters of Woodmont Baptist Church and is produced by Woodmont Baptist Television. Thanks for watching.